Planting trees is a pretty daft answer to global warming. Let me explain. I'm one of the greatest lovers of trees, but the fact of the matter is that planting 10 million or 100 million of them will not directly affect the global warming crisis for a great many years. Let's look at this tree here. This tree is probably 30 or 40 or 50 years old. When it's about 100 years old, it's probably got to more or less its maximum life, and it will be knocked down by a storm if it hasn't already been knocked down before then. When that happens, that tree trunk will fall to the ground and every molecule of that carbon inside that tree will then become food for a vast variety of different organisms which will be sustained by the ecological microsystem in that tree trunk as it rots and decays. Now I promise you, if you go either into this garden or into a rainforest or wherever in 10 or 15 years time after that tree has fallen down you will begin to discover that the lumps of tree trunk that remain are getting lighter and lighter until they are as friable as dust. Why? Because of the organisms that have turned that carbon into carbon dioxide for their own survival. Eventually when you walk past in 20 years time you will find nothing but black soil. And you might say, well, the carbon is in the soil. I'm sorry, it isn't. If you were to then dig up a square metre of the soil where a lump of that tree trunk was and to burn it, you will then be able to tell the difference between the soil with carbon in it and the soil without, and you will find not much difference. What's more, if you go to a forest floor, that is, say, it's been a forest for a 100 years or a 1,000 years, you'll find not much difference in the amount of carbon deposited there. You might say, well, how can this be? What happens to old carbon then? What about coal and all of that kind of stuff? Well, only a tiny amount of the carbon that is fixed from carbon dioxide by sunlight, by trees and plants, only the tiniest fraction of that is fixed in a stable way which will remain permanently in the ground. And it only really happens under special conditions which you see in peaty bogs and things like that where the soil structure is so wet and so acid and so hostile to bacteria and fungi that literally nothing can grow in that wood. And then when those leaves and twigs and bits of tree fall into that bog they remain there, they get pickled and fossilized eventually, uh, compressed under a mighty weight of rock and debris and all kinds of other stuff above, and we get, millions of years later, coal, gas, or oil. Now, that's not going to happen in your average rainforest or, uh, or, or, uh, or, or in a garden or anywhere like that. So what we see is this. You can plant a tree today, it will fix about a ton of carbon in its entire lifetime over the next hundred years. When it falls over, almost every molecule of that ton of carbon will be released back as carbon dioxide exactly where it came from. In that case you might say, so what is the answer? How do we deal with prehistoric carbon, carbon that was fixed and frozen in time, locked under substrata of rock for many millions of years, then dug up by human beings in a liquid form or gas or as coal and burnt, released into the atmosphere, what on earth do we do about this prehistoric carbon? Well, there's only really one answer for it, and that is to take it back out of the atmosphere and put it back under the ground. And if you can't do that, then at least to do what we call carbon capture or carbon sequestration by putting a cap on top of oil, gas and coal-fired power stations to capture carbon dioxide and then store it permanently. Can it be done? <laughs> yes, it can. In fact, it costs uh, not as much as you might think to capture 90% of all carbon dioxide that's coming out of a big power station. In Vattenfall, uh, Vattenfall is a company, a generating company in Norway, it has huge power stations and with a big cap of a carbon capture on just one of its power stations, it is now capturing 90% of all of that output, putting it back under another pipe. One pipe brings North Sea gas up to the power station. Another pipe brings exhaust gas enriched with carbon dioxide and puts it back under the sea. The more you pump back, the more you raise the pressure in the gas field and the more you can extract. So it's quite a double uh, benefit. But not only that, this single unit is supplying, uh, in 2007, around 70% of all the Kyoto compliance requirements for the entire nation of Norway, which is a spectacular gain. Now, 
That creates a carbon credit. Carbon credits can be sold on the market for next year in 2008. They will win about 27, 28 euros per tonne. So what it means is that you can have a power station which isn't commercially viable with its carbon capture technology. But by the time you sell the carbon credits that you get, that's quite a complicated idea, but a carbon credit, the idea of that is that if I do something that, that, that saves, say, half of my carbon use in a year, and I'm a manufacturer of plastics, then I can gain a carbon credit by doing that. And someone else might need that to offset some of the carbon they're using. Have a look at videos elsewhere on this. But the fact of the matter is that people will pay huge amounts of money, 27 euros per tonne at the moment, in order to offset their own carbon use. And those credits can make some of these technologies viable. But even if you didn't have them, the cost of, uh, to the retailer in terms of, uh, uh, of, of actually selling electricity isn't as great as you think. It's true that to cap with carbon capture technology, to cap a power station that exists already and capture 90% of that carbon will double the manufacturing cost of electricity. So you might say, well, that's absurd. It will double the price of electricity for ordinary men and women in a nation. No, it won't. You see, a big element of the retail cost of electricity is the distribution. We lose a lot through the wires. It's also the billing, the marketing, the, uh, all the other things that electricity companies actually do. And all of this takes cost. So if you actually look at the entire picture, you would find that even putting uh, the, the most uh, advanced carbon capture technology on a power station, capturing 90% of the output of carbon and storing it forever, that would probably only add 20% to the retail cost of electricity using today's technology. And tomorrow's will be even better. 20% you say, that's a lot. It's not. It's about a 1% addition in price of electricity per year for 20 years. Well. Just with a small amount of energy saving, putting in energy saving light bulbs and a few other things, turning off standbys on your TV and, and things like that, that will save you more than 1% of electricity per year. So what it means is, we can probably cap most power stations in the world, coal-fired power stations, gas-fired, oil-fired power stations, for virtually nothing using today's technology and make a very significant difference to the world's total production of carbon dioxide. But trees like this, well... Don't burn them. Don't cut them down if you can avoid it. If you are going to cut it down, replace it with another in sustainable forestry. But don't kid yourself, the planting of few trees today is going to save the world tomorrow.